Good day, everyone. Today, we are going to discuss about blood donation and blood component preparation. First, let us try to describe or define what is blood donation. Blood donation is an act that happens when a person voluntarily has blood drawn and used for transfusion to another individual. It involves collecting blood from a donor so it can be used to treat someone else. Remember that when a person donates his or her own blood, um, it should be according to his will. Okay, so no one should force a person to donate blood. Now we go to the different types of blood donation. There are basically four types of blood donation, and these are directed, allogenic, autologous, and apheresis. In the succeeding slides of this presentation, um, we would be able to find out the definition of the different blood donation types. Okay, so we start first with the directed blood donation. So in this type of blood donation, blood from the donor is intended for the use of a specific patient. In this type of donation, also the recipient chooses the donor. So it could be a close friend or um, a family member, depending on the choice of the donor. Blood from the directed donor is no safer than blood from the volunteer blood supply. This is because um, even if the source of the blood comes from a close friend or a family member, it would still undergo the screening for your uh, transfusion transmitted infection the same way that blood from the volunteer blood supply would also be screened for this uh, TTIs. The only difference between um, directed blood donation and the blood coming from the volunteer blood supply is that for directed blood donation, the recipient knows the donor, but for the volunteer blood supply, uh, most of the time, the recipient does not know who is the donor of the blood. Next, we have the allogenic blood donation. So this is commonly referred to as whole blood donation. And blood donated is intended for the use of general patient population. So example for this one is blood coming from mass blood donation. Mass blood donations are done by most hospitals to increase their supply in the blood banking laboratory. So um, people or personnel from the blood bank laboratory would go to um, places wherein um, they would perform mass blood donation drives okay, to um, encourage people to donate blood and at the same time um, increase the supply of blood in the laboratory for hospital consumption. Okay. So this photo is an example of a mass blood donation. So what we can see here are people in the venue, potential donors that would be part of the activity. So before a donor is bled or collected blood, um, he or she must undergo an interview that is conducted by a medical doctor or physician. And then after he or she has passed the interview, um, he would also undergo physical examination wherein his weight, his blood pressure, his hematocrit and hemoglobin will be checked. And if um, he was able to pass all these tests, he would then be um, eligible to donate blood. So if in this picture, you can see people lying on beds so they are already undergoing um, blood donation, okay? So um, remember that uh, blood coming from a mass blood donation is also known as your allogenic type of blood donation. So it is intended for the use of the general patient population. 
So the next type of blood donation or the third type of blood donation is known as your autologous blood donation. So this is the blood donated by the owner for future use. So that means to say that your autologous donor is referred to as the donor patient because he is the donor and at the same time he is the recipient of his own donated blood. Okay, so that is your autologous blood donation. The last type of blood donation is called your apheresis. So, um, in this type of blood donation, um, a person donates a specific component of his own blood and then the remaining parts that will not be transfused to the recipient must be returned back to the donor. So usually an apheresis type or an apheresis blood donation takes about two to three hours and um, components are separated based on their specific gravity or weight. So for example, if the recipient will only need platelets, then um, the only component that must be collected or removed from the donor are the platelets and the rest of the components must be returned back to the donor. Or if the component that is needed by the recipient is just the WBCs, then the WBCs are the only um, component that must be collected and the rest will be returned back to the donor. So in apheresis blood donation, we said that uh, only a certain component of the blood will be removed if that is the only component that is needed by the recipient and the rest must be returned back to the donor. So in order for that to happen, um, we have to subject the blood components to different centrifugation methods. So for apheresis uh, blood donation, we have two types of centrifugation methods. The first method is known as your intermittent flow centrifugation or IFC. So blood is processed in batches or cycles or passes. So what are the steps in performing your intermittent flow centrifugation? The first one is draw, which means that the whole blood of the donor is drawn using a pump and then we have to spin the blood uh, or we have to centrifuge the components of the donor's blood. And the third step is called your dwell and surge, wherein there is separation of the desired and undesired components. And finally, the last step is return, wherein um, the components that are not needed will be reinfused back to the donor. So that is your intermittent flow centrifugation. So this is an example of a photo showing you how intermittent flow centrifugation is done. So take note guys that for IFC, there is only one venipuncture that must be done to the donor. Okay, only one venipuncture. That means to say that that venipuncture is the passageway of taking out the blood component and the old the only way for the reinfusion of the unwanted or undesired blood components, okay? So again, for IFC, there is only one venipuncture performed. The second centrifugation method for apheresis is called your continuous flow centrifugation or CFC. So this is the process of withdrawal, processing, and reinfusion of the blood simultaneously in a continuous manner. So there are two venipuncture sites that are needed. So one on the right arm and one on the left arm of the donor. So this is how your continuous flow centrifugation looks like. So notice that there are two venipunctures, one on the right arm and one on the left arm. So since CFC is a simultaneous process, um, it only means that when blood is removed from the body, it goes out from the venipuncture done on the right arm and the undesired components will have to go back on the venipuncture on the left arm. Unlike your intermittent flow centrifugation wherein there is only one venipuncture, there is also or there is only one way for blood 
to be removed and only one way which is the same venipuncture site for blood to be infused back to your donor. So we also have different types of apheresis. We have five types. So we have platelet pheresis, plasma pheresis, leukapheresis, erythrocytopheresis, and your HPC pheresis. So let's try to define or know what are these different types of apheresis. The first type of apheresis is what we call platelet pheresis, and it's otherwise known as thrombocytopheresis. So this is the most commonly requested type of apheresis in blood bank laboratories because platelets are also the most requested blood component that is usually needed by the recipient. So more than 75% of platelet transfusions are made possible because of the advancement in your platelet pheresis or the method of um, getting only the platelets and the rest of the components are returned back to the donor. So a, a unit is called single donor platelet or SDP and one platelet pheresis unit is equivalent to six to eight random donor platelets. Now let's try to differentiate between your SDP and RDP. So your single donor platelet um, these are prepared by the platelet apheresis machine. On the other hand, your random donor platelets or RDP are prepared from donated blood within 4 to 6 hours of collection uh, through centrifugation and it contains approximately 5.5 times 10 to the 10 platelets. So that is the amount of platelets that you can find in your RDP. The next type of apheresis is what we call leukapheresis. So from the word leukapheresis, it can be noted that the component being harvested here is your leukocyte or our leukocyte. So apheresis is the only effective method for collecting our white blood cells, specifically our granulocytes. So donors are given drugs or sedimenting agents to increase the recovery of our white blood cells. So what are these um, drugs or sedimenting agents. So we have several. First, we have our HES or the hydroxyethyl starch. We also use prednisone, uh, dexamethasone, and growth factor. So your hydroxyethyl starch or your HES, this is actually not a WBC sedimenting agent but it's a red blood cell sedimenting agent. Um, it allows better separation of layers during centrifugation resulting in an improved yield with reduced RBC contamination. So only the target cells are collected and these are our leukocytes. However, um, immediate side effects of using HES as a sedimenting agent include um, circulatory volume expansion with headaches and peripheral edema. Um, next, we have our prednisone and dexamethasone. So these are oral corticosteroids and their function is to actually mobilize and increase the number of circulating granulocytes for easy collection of um, the cells. And lastly, we have our growth factors, um, specifically your granulocyte uh, colony stimulating factors. This is a recombinant hematopoietic growth factor and it increases our granulocyte yield. However, the side effects would include muscle and skeletal pain. Okay, the next type of apheresis we have here is what we call erythrocytopheresis. So um, this means that uh, removal of your red blood cells. So double RBC pheresis that is basically equal to two units of red cells that are collected using the apheresis machine. If you are a frequent donor for red blood cells uh, through apheresis, you have to take note of the donation frequency. So for successful completion, um, that means you are able to donate your red blood cells in 16 weeks or 4 months. If there is red cell loss of less than 200 ml, you are only um, allowed to donate in less than 8 weeks. If there is red cell loss of greater than 200 ml but less than 300 ml, 
um, the donation of frequency is 8 weeks. And if red cell loss is more than 300 ml, then you are able to donate the same with a successful completion for um, 4 months or 16 weeks. However, guys, according to the 7th edition Harmoning, um, erythrocytophoresis, um, it's also known as your red blood cell exchange, and um, it's usually done as a therapeutic form of aphoresis. So it removes a large number of red blood cells from the patient and return the patient's plasma and platelets along with compatible allogenic donor RBC. So this procedure is most commonly performed in patients um, with sickle cell disease in order to decrease the number of hemoglobin S containing RBCs, thereby treating or preventing any complications. Okay, aside from that, another application of your erythrocytophoresis, um, it is used to remove incompatible RBCs from a patient circulation. So for example, the emergent transfusion of your RH positive red blood cells to an RH negative female of childbearing potential or an ABO mismatch transfusion. Okay, so in cases of um, emergency wherein there is accidental um, transfusion of um, units that are incompatible, um, the erythrocytophoresis can be used as a therapeutic procedure to remove the unwanted component. Okay, so the last type of aphoresis we have is what we call your HPC pheresis. So this involves the collection of your hematopoietic progenitor cells or the peripheral blood stem cells. And our hematopoietic growth factors, particularly our granulocyte um, colony stimulating factor, is used to increase the number of circulating stem cells prior to the procedure. Uh, this is also to increase the yield. Okay, so the procedure for HPC pheresis, it's more like or much like the donor leukapheresis with a selective collection of mononuclear cells since your HPCs are found in the upper portion of the Buffy coat during centrifugation. At least one and sometimes two or three or two to three apheresis collections are usually needed to produce an acceptable dose. Each collection procedure usually lasts for four to six hours since very large blood volumes are processed in order to obtain the required yield. There are several advantages to using your HPC for assist. Um, first is that um, it does not require the use of your anesthesia, so it is avoided. And the procedure can be performed safely in the outpatient setting. So this table shows you the different aphoresis component collected or donated and the frequency of donation per aphoresis component. So for example, if you are a donor of two units of RBC, the frequency of donation is every 16 weeks or every four months. Um, if you are a frequent donor of plasma, um, you can donate every two days, but not more than twice in seven days, okay? If you are an infrequent plasma donor, you can donate every four weeks or every month, but not more than 13 times in a year, okay? So it should be less than or equal to 13 times in a year. And if you are um, a donor of platelets, uh, specifically single aphoresis unit of platelets, uh, you can donate every two days, but not more than twice in seven days or not more than 24 times in a year. Okay, so you have to take note of this frequency of donation. Another is if you are a donor of platelets for double or triple aphoresis unit, uh, frequency of donation is every seven days. And lastly, for granulocytes or white blood cells, you can donate every two days. Now, the reason why there is frequency of donation for specific um, blood components, um, it's because we are trying to restore the supply or the amount of um, certain components that 
were removed from the donor's body. So we want the donor's body to recover from the donation before he or she can perform or undergo donation again. Okay, so you have to ensure, we have to ensure the safety of our donors um, after they have um, given or donated their own blood. And with the different types of apheresis, we now go to the different types of blood donors. So we have three types. The first one is called your voluntary non-remunerated. Second, we have the professional or commercial donor. And lastly, we have the family or replacement donor. So let's try to um, describe each type of blood donor. Okay, so the first type of blood donor we have is your voluntary or your non-remunerated donor. So this person donates on his own free will without receiving any payment or incentives after donation. Okay, so this person has actually internalized the contents of your RA7719. On the other hand, the opposite of your voluntary or non-remunerated is your professional or the commercial um blood donor so this type of blood donor donates blood for the sake of money well actually there are some people or individual who made um a living out of donating blood okay so even if there is already your ra7719 still there are people who donate blood um, in exchange for money or incentives okay the last type of blood donor is what we call your family or replacement blood donor. So this person donates blood for somebody in the community and allows family and friends to make donations to replace blood that was utilized by you. So this um, is a common scenario or situation in most hospitals, especially if the inpatient utilized or borrowed a blood unit from the laboratory so before he or she is discharged by the hospital he has to replace first the blood unit that he used during his blood transfusion so that is so any donor that would um, donate blood for that certain patient uh, regardless if they are compatible or not in terms of the blood type is what we call the family or replacement blood donor Okay, in addition to the three types of blood donors that were mentioned earlier, there are still other, or there are two more uh, types of blood donor. So we have the walk-in donor. So this type of donor is more common in allogenic donations. Okay, and your walking donor, um, this type of donor is just waiting for the signal to donate. They already passed the screening test and also... Aside from the screening test, they were also able to pass the medical history interview that was done by the physician or medical doctor. And this type of donor is usually for patients who need fresh blood. Basically, your walking donor are also the types of donors that have uh, rare blood types. Okay. And they are just like one text or one call away if someone um, needs their blood for transfusion. Okay, so uh, the blood banking laboratory has already their personal contact number so that once there would be someone from the hospital that would need a blood transfusion of a rare blood type, they can easily call these walking donors. Now, okay. Okay, so now we go to the different steps in blood donation. So the first step is, of course, donor recruitment and registration, and that is followed by donor selection and screening, then um, blood extraction or bleeding of the donor, and lastly, your blood storage. So for the donor recruitment and registration, usually potential donors would fill out forms um, with the following details, the name of the donor, the first, the last, and the middle initial, and the date and time of donation. We have the address, the contact information, the gender, and the age or date of birth. So these are the important details that are seen um, in the form uh, filled out by potential donors. 
Okay, so the second step in blood donation is your donor selection and screening. And under this step, we have two sub-steps. We have the medical history interview and the physical examination. So before the donor goes to the physical examination or undergoes physical examination, he should be able to pass first the medical history interview which will be conducted by the physician. So this is essential to ensure the benefit of both the donor and the recipient. And usually, the medical history interview is in a form of questionnaires, but um, it's not the donor who will write the answers to the questions in the questionnaire, but it is the job of the physician to take down the answers or jot down the answers of the patient. Okay, so um, the questionnaires would include questions to protect the donor and also questions to protect the patient. So the questions on the questionnaire would pertain to the travel history of the donor, the drug intake of the donor. So um, the drug intake could mean um, supplements or any maintenance medicine for hypertension probably or diabetes. Um, that should be honestly answered by the donor. Then um, questions would also pertain to previous donations, um, previous transfusion or transplantation, sexual partners of the donor, and heredity. So please take note, guys, that these questions are confidential and um, it should only be between the potential donor and the physician. So right after the donor passes the medical history interview, he can now proceed to the next step, which is a physical examination. So for the physical examination, um, there are also factors that the blood bankers or medical technologists would look into to see if the donor can qualify for blood donation. And one of the factors would be the age of the potential donor. So for autologous donations, um, there is no age requirement for this one. However, for allogenic donations, meaning to say you are going to donate blood for someone else, the age requirement would be um, 16 or 17 years old. Okay, 16 or 17 years old and up. Okay, so that is the age requirement. However, there is a note here that for donors who are 18 below they must secure parents consent okay that they are allowed to undergo blood donation but for um donors who are age 65 years old and above they must secure physician's consent okay so that is the requirement for um individuals who are below 18 and more than 65 years old Another factor that we would look into during the physical examination of the donor is the donor's weight. So for autologous donation, um, like the age, there is also no weight requirement. However, for allogenic um, donation, um, the minimum weight requirement is 50 kilograms or 110 pounds, and that would equal to a volume of 450 ml. So this is the amount of blood that will remove that will be removed from the body of the donor. So for the temperature also, we would also check for the temperature to see if um, the donor is febrile or not. So um, the normal temperature for physical examination is 37.5 degrees Celsius, and that is equal to 99.5 degrees Fahrenheit, okay? Okay, so for autologous donors, since um, these donors don't have weight requirement, uh, we have to make necessary corrections in terms of the volume of blood that must be collected and also the amount of anticoagulant that must be used for that certain volume of blood. So, for example, if the donor weighs less than 50 kilograms or less than 110 pounds, we have to make or make use of this uh, formula to derive at the volume 
of blood that must be collected and also to know the amount of anticoagulant that must be used. So for the volume of blood to be collected, we have the donor's weight divided by the minimum weight. So the minimum weight requirement is always 50 kilograms and then we have to multiply the answer by 450 ml since 450 ml is um, also the required amount of blood um, that must be collected um, if the minimum weight is 50 kilograms. Next, we have to also calculate for the volume of the needed anticoagulant. So you have the formula here, the volume of blood to be collected divided by 450 ml multiplied by 63 ml of anticoagulant. Always remember guys that our blood bag, it it has already a fixed volume of anticoagulant present in it and that is 63 ml enough for um, the collected 450 ml of your blood and the third equation that we use is the volume of anticoagulant to be removed so the 63 ml which is the fixed amount of anticoagulant inside the blood bag, you have to subtract from there the volume of anticoagulant needed. Okay? So I made a sample calculation here given that the donor's weight is less than 50 kilograms. So the sample um, weight here is 48 kilograms. Okay, so we need to calculate for the volume of the blood to be collected from a donor who weighs 48 kilograms. So all we need to do is to substitute the formula with um, the weight of the patient, which is 48 kilograms, divided by the minimum weight requirement for blood donation, which is 50 kilograms, and multiply the answer by 450 ml so always remember that this 450 ml the 50 kilograms and also the 63 ml these are constant values okay so going back we divide the donor's weight by 50 kilograms and then multiply the answer to 450 ml the answer is 432 ml okay so this is the amount of blood that must be collected from the donor weighing 48 kilograms the next thing that we have to solve is the volume of anticoagulant needed anticoagulant needed for the 432 ml of blood so substitute the formula with a value so you have here the volume of the blood to be collected that is 432 ml divided by 450 ml the answer to this should be multiplied to 63 ml so 63 ml is actually the fixed amount or volume of anticoagulant that is present inside the blood bag okay so the answer for that is 60.48 ml so this means to say that for the 432 ml of blood collected from a 48 kilogram donor, you have to use 60.48 ml of your anticoagulant. Okay, but we are not done yet because we still have to determine the volume of anticoagulant to be removed. Remember that our 63 ml, this is a fixed volume inside the blood bag. So in order to determine the amount of anticoagulant to be removed from the blood bag all we need to do is subtract the 60.48 ml from the 63 ml so 63 minus 60.48 you have 2.52 ml so this is the amount of anticoagulant to be removed from the blood bag Okay, so next for physical examination, we also have to check for the pulse rate of the patient. So pulse rate should be 50 to 100 beats per minute. And for the blood pressure, so you have to check for the systolic and diastolic pressure. For the systolic pressure, pressure should be between 90 to 160 mmHg. And for the diastolic pressure, it should be between 60 to 100 mmHg. So for hypotensive and hypertensive patients, they are not accepted as blood donors. So we also check for 
um, presence of TTIs or your transfusion transmitted infections. And um, these are the serological tests and blood processing that must be done on the patient sample. We have to perform ABO grouping and RH typing, um, antibody screening, HBSAG, anti-HBC, anti-HCV, anti-HIV1 and 2, your anti-HTLV, syphilis, and malaria. So we have to ensure or make sure that all of these um, tests are done on the sample of our potential donor to ensure that the blood that he will donate will be free from transfusion transmitted infection that might be um, given to the recipient. Okay, so now if the donor has already passed the physical examination, he can now proceed to the next step of the donation, which is the blood extraction or bleeding. So the entire process of bleeding would take for about 15 to 30 minutes. And um, the responsibility of the med tech here is to guard the donor during donation and be alert for any donor reactions okay because if the donor is uncomfortable while doing the blood extraction or bleeding then there is always a tendency that the donation would fail okay and that means na you will be wasting the blood bag so you have to make sure that everything is perfect and the donor is um lying comfortably Okay, and he or she does not feel anything um, with regards to the donation, okay, or when he or she is donating his blood. So, what are some common donor reactions? Common donor reactions can be categorized into three. So, we have mild, moderate, and severe. Here are some of the mild donor reactions that our patients may experience during blood extraction. Okay, so uh, they could experience syncope or fainting, nausea or vomiting, uh, hyperventilation. You also have twitching or spasms, convulsions, sweating, dizziness, uh, the feel of the feeling of anxiety or nervousness, palpitations, and pallor. So. Um, if you are able to observe this one during blood extraction process and then you saw that your patient or the donor is struggling, you have to attend immediately to the needs of your donor. You have to immediately remove the tourniquet and the, the needle. Okay, and then you have to ensure that they are safe or these donor reactions would subside. Okay. And even if your blood bag is already almost full and then in the middle of the blood extraction, um, you observe for donor reactions like your donor starts to faint or starts to feel dizzy, you have to remove everything, okay? You have to ensure first the safety of your donor, okay? So for moderate donor reactions, here are... Um, some of the reactions that we might observe from our donors. Uh, we have here reaction seen under the mild category in addition to loss of consciousness. Okay, then you have decreased pulse rate, hyperventilation, and the drop in systolic pressure to 60 mmHg. So that means your donor is becoming hypotensive. So again, guys, um, if you can observe these donor reactions, please discontinue the blood donation or the blood extraction process. For severe donor reactions, we have convulsions, marked hyperventilation, and epilepsy. So since this is already severe, okay, so um, it is understandable that you really have to abort the blood extraction process. You have to remove everything from the tourniquet down to the needle and then you make sure that the needle is away from 
the donor to prevent um accidental needle stick injuries okay make sure guys to stabilize your patient first and ensure de their safety so after you have successfully collected blood from your donor okay so that means that you were able to collect the 450 ml of blood from the donor you have to store the blood unit in the storage area so the storage area in the blood bank laboratory what we can see there are actually refrigerators and some um blood bank machines okay so we store our whole blood units at one to six degrees celsius okay and the principle is first in first out so that means the first blood bag that you place inside the refrigerator that is also the same blood bag that you have to take out just in case it would be needed for transfusion okay so blood storage or storage lesion it is a loss of viability and function associated with certain biochemical change that happens when blood is stored in vitro and also guys please take note that the shelf life of our blood components would um differ depending on the anticoagulant preservative solution that you are using or present inside your blood bag so when we store our blood units for a long period of time inside the refrigerator no uh, there would always be the decrease and increase components okay so our decrease components would include the glucose atp sodium ph our white blood cells and the 23 dpg the increased components are your plasma hemoglobin potassium ldh and your ammonia for the storage of the different blood components we have here our whole blood units can be stored at refrigerator temperature which is one to six degrees celsius and our red blood cells can also be stored at freezing temperature so our rbc's can be stored at negative 65 degrees celsius less than or equal to negative 65 degrees celsius and take note that this is the maximum temperature needed for high glycerol procedure for rbc freezing for plasma we can also store plasma at freezing temperatures so we can store them at negative 18 degrees celsius or negative 65 degrees celsius for platelets um this these components are usually stored at room temperature 20 to 24 degrees celsius with constant agitation and lastly our granulocytes or leukocytes the same with your platelets they are also stored at 20 to 24 degrees celsius but unlike your platelets your granulocytes and leukocytes um, do not need constant agitation now we go to the deferral so deferral is defined as prevention of the donor from donating his or her own blood due to some circumstances okay the deferral may be permanent indefinite or temporary during permanent deferral a prospective donor will never be able to donate blood for someone else if he can donate blood then that would only be limited to autologous donation so he can only donate blood for himself so this is a result from the testing performed on previous donation and an example for that would be the donor stating that he or she has hepatitis c so um, later on in the succeeding slides you would be able to know what are the reasons for permanent deferral and one of the reasons would be a person who has been infected by hepatitis virus so hepatitis c virus so this person would be unable to donate for the rest of his life so here are some reasons that would permanently defer an individual from donating blood first is donor receiving cells tissues or organs from a non-human animal source um, like porcine heart valves and porcine insulin so these tissues or organs are from pigs 
and we call this process as xenotransplantation. So if the physician finds out that you have been um, transplanted with these tissues or organs, or if you have received any of these organs, you are permanently deferred from donating. Next, we have anyone diagnosed with creutzfeldt jakob disease or the variant CJD. Your CJD and the variant CJD are members of a group of neurological disorders known as the transmissible spongiform encephalopathies or prion diseases which affect sheep, cows, and even humans. It results in progressive dementia and spongiform alterations in the brain which is rapidly fatal. It can be transmitted by corneal transplants, human duramater grafts, pituitary derived human growth hormone, and neurosurgical instruments. Um, it can also infect humans by eating beef contaminated with prions, abnormal proteins found in the brain tissue of diseased cattle, which led to the term mad cow disease. So prions are highly resistant to heat and ultraviolet light, exposures that effectively kill bacteria and viruses. So those are the reasons why... Um, if an individual is diagnosed with this disorder or disease, um, he will be permanently deferred from donating. Next, we have after cessation of tegison or etretinate intake. So, um, the reason why an individual is permanently deferred if he or she is taking in tegison because um, this medication can cause birth defects. So, your donated blood could contain high levels to damage the unborn baby if transfused to a pregnant woman. Once the medication has been cleared from your blood, you may donate again. But for Tegison, um, this medication is an exception because you have to be permanently deferred. Other reasons for permanent deferral include um, donors with a positive HBSAG or hepatitis B surface antigen um, in serological tests, clinical history or diagnosis of viral hepatitis at age 11 or older, people receiving human growth hormone. So growth hormone from the human pituitary gland was prescribed for children with delayed or impaired growth. The hormone was obtained from the human pituitary gland, which are found in the brain, and some people who took this hormone develop a rare nervous system condition called the CJD, and um, it calls for a permanent deferral. Okay, And then we also have history of dura matter transplant or graft, which would also cause CJD and severe liver, cardiac, or lung disease. So, so next we have another type of deferral which is temporary. So the prospective donor is unable to donate blood for a limited period of time. For example, if the donor has received a blood transfusion, he or she is deferred for one year from the date of transfusion or if the donor was able to receive vaccination for yellow fever, he or she is deferred for two weeks from date of vaccination. So after one year or after two weeks, he can be able to donate blood again. For situations that would call for a temporary deferral, um, here are some of the examples. For three years, um, after cessation of soriatine or acetretin intake, usually given for severe psoriasis. So, um, if you have taken or are taking Proscar, Avodart, Propecia, Accutane, Soriatane, or Tegison, these medications can cause birth defects. So, high levels of these medications um, would be enough to damage the unborn baby if transfused to a pregnant woman. So, once the medication has been cleared um, from your blood, you may donate again. So, for soriatane, um, yeah, you can only donate after three years okay, from the date of the cessation or intake of the medication. Next, um, an immigrant or refugee who has lived longer than five consecutive years in countries considered malaria endemic. 
Okay, and then individuals who have been a resident of non-endemic countries for less than three consecutive years. Um, a three-year deferral is also given to individuals who have traveled to an area where malaria is endemic after departure from the malaria endemic area. So um, an example for this, if you're from Dumaguete City and you're going to travel to Palawan because we know that Palawan is endemic for malaria, uh, like if you want to take a vacation in Palawan for three days, so after three days, you have to go back to Dumaguete. So you can only donate after three years after you have departed the malaria endemic area. Okay, so um, that's what this statement means. Next, you have a prior resident of malaria endemic country returns to a malaria endemic area after residence for two years consecutively in a non-endemic country. And those who have had a diagnosis of malaria three years after becoming asymptomatic. A one-year temporary deferral is also given to individuals who have received or have been administered with the hepatitis B immunoglobulin or HBIG. And then next, we have after therapeutic rabies vaccination, um, rape victims are also given one-year deferral. Um, individuals who have tattoos, permanent makeup, ear and body piercings, and incarceration in jail for more than 72 consecutive hours or three days in jail. So you are given one year um, blood donation deferral. For individuals who have um, received transfusion of blood components or have history of syphilis and gonorrhea, um, you are also given one year deferral. Or if you're a woman receiving a transfusion during her pregnancy, or you are part of an experimental medication or unlicensed experimental vaccine which is associated with research protocol, you are given one year before you are able to donate blood for other people. Um, another one year deferral is also given to individuals who have received transplant of human tissues like organ, tissue, bone marrow transplant, or bone or skin graft. Now take note that this um, type of transplant is not the xenograft, but this is more of the allograft. Okay, so you're only given one year blood donation deferral. Um, you're also given a one-year deferral if you came in contact with someone else's blood or if you have experienced accidental needle stick injury. And after sexual contact with a person with clinical or laboratory evidence of HIV infection or who is at risk for infection. One-year deferral is also given to a prostitute or anyone else who takes money or drugs or other payments for sex, anyone who is a past or present IV drug abuser, or any person with hemophilia or any related blood disorder who has received factor concentrates. Um, also included in the one-year deferral are women who have had sex with men who have had sex with another man. A one-year deferral is also given to males who have had sex with another male. So this um, person, this male person may donate whole blood if they have not had sex with another male in the past year. And also sexual contact or living with a person who has hepatitis. A two-month deferral is also given or granted to a person who have just recently finished blood donation. For one month, um, if a person receives a German missiles vaccination or the, um, for rubella, and after cessation of the drug isotretinoin or Accutane for acne treatment, one-month deferral is also given if... Um, 
after cessation of the drug finasteride or proscar for the treatment of benign prostatic hyperplasia and after cessation of the drug propecia for baldness. For women who have um, delivered their baby in the Philippines or nine months after childbirth, you are given six weeks as temporary um, blood donation deferral or termination of pregnancy. For two weeks, you have after vaccination with oral polio, measles, mumps, or yellow fever, or for two weeks after the immune reaction to smallpox vaccination. And after cessation of Plavix, or take lead intake to reduce um, acute myocardial infarction and stroke. A person is given 48 hours um, temporary deferral um, when a person undergoes whole blood donation that is deferred after hemophoresis and cessation of aspirin and pyroxicam intake and also cessation of Feldin intake for mild to moderate arthritis pain. For 12 hours, um, you have alcohol intake and for 4 hours after smoking. So for the last type of deferral, we have the indefinite deferral. So for this type of deferral, the prospective donor is unable to donate blood for someone else for an unspecified period of time due to current regulatory requirements. So this donor would not be able to donate blood until the current requirement changes. He or she may be eligible to donate autologous blood only. So for example, if the donor states that they have lived in England for one year in 1989, um, he or she must be indefinitely deferred. So these are the following situations that would qualify a person to be indefinitely deferred. First, you have if the person receives bovine insulin as treatment for diabetes. Second, anyone who is a blood relative of someone diagnosed with CJD or VC VCJD or the variant um, Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease, uh, family history of Chagas disease or babesiosis, persons with clinical or laboratory diagnosis of HIV infection. Next, we have donors with evidence of past or present non-prescription drug use and donor reacted positively for anti-HBC on more than one occasion. In addition to that, we also have a donor with a positive HBC nucleic acid testing, um, history of bleeding problems following surgery, invasive dental procedures, cuts or abrasions, um, diseases of the blood such as hemophilia, Kaposi sarcoma, or polycythemia. And then you have history of receiving clotting factor concentrates and donor who indicates having had sex with a person who was born in any of the African countries. So we're done with um, the deferrals and the different types of deferrals and what are the different situations that would prevent or hinder a person from donating blood. So now we go to the blood component preparation. So your whole blood unit is actually the product of a successful um, blood extraction. Okay, so our whole blood can actually be separated into different components. Okay, based on um, the demand of the recipient or the needs of the recipient for transfusion. So our whole blood can be um, separated into the PAC RBC or the platelet-rich plasma or the PRP. So this can only happen if we subject our whole blood unit to soft or light spin for 2 to 3 minutes at 3,200 RPM. So after that, you already have your PAC RBC and your platelet-rich plasma or PRP. Now, remember that the heavier components will always settle at the bottom of your blood bag and the lighter components um, can be found on top of your 
um, pack RBC. So, our platelet-rich plasma can be further um, separated into two components. So, you have your platelet concentrate and your platelet-poor plasma. So, you just have to subject your PRP to a hard or heavy spin for 5 minutes at 3,600 revolutions per minute. Next, your PPP can be further separated into two components. So, um, we can place our platelet-poor plasma inside a freezer at negative 18 or negative 65 degrees Celsius. So, our PPP can be um, further classified into frozen plasma or PF24. By the way, the PF24 here means plasma frozen within 24 hours after phlebotomy. Or our PPP can be fresh frozen plasma or the FFP. And then if we subject our frozen plasma or PF24 to fractionation, we can actually obtain our plasma derivatives. Our FFP, on the other hand, or our fresh frozen plasma, um, if we are going to subject this to slow thawing at 1 to 6 degrees Celsius, um, it can be, uh, we can obtain our cryoprecipitate or our cryo. So for the blood components, here is a summary a tabular summary of all the blood components, their shelf life, their storage temperature, and the indications for use. So it would be easier for you to study and understand. Okay, so for your whole blood and your red blood cells, the storage temperature for these components is 1 to 6 degrees Celsius. So again, that is um, refrigerator temperature except for your... Um, red blood cells that are stored at negative 65 degrees Celsius, okay? So, also, the shelf life of our whole blood would depend on the anticoagulant preservative solution that is present inside a blood bag. So, the indications for use, um, your whole blood, it's used for volume expansion and, of course, um, increase uh, oxygen levels. For whole blood, for irradiated whole blood, the shelf life for this one is um, original outdate or 28 days from irradiation. By the way, irradiation of cellular blood components like your red blood cells, platelets, and granulocytes is indicated to prevent the development of transfusion-associated graft-versus-host disease or the TAGVHD. So patients at risk of um, GVHD include immunocompromised patients who are receiving a bone marrow or stem cell transplant and fetuses undergoing an intrauterine transfusion. So irradiation is also indicated for recipients of components collected from a blood relative or HLA matched donors. So again, um, if you can see um, beside a component that it's irradiated, it is the reason for that is to prevent your graft versus host disease. Okay. For leukoreduced red blood cells, the shelf life for this one is if it's a closed system, um, the shelf life would depend on again the anticoagulant preservative solution that is present inside a blood bag. However, if it is an open system, the shelf life of the component is only 24 hours. Okay. And then the storage temperature is 1 to 6 degrees Celsius. And um, also, the reason why we have to perform leukoreduction of our red blood cells is to decrease the incidence of febrile transfusion reactions, to decrease the risk of cytomegalovirus transmission, to CMV negative immunocompromise or pregnant recipients, and to decrease sensitization to human leukocyte antigens. Okay, which is an important aspect for transplant patients and platelet transfusion refractoriness. Okay, for washed RBCs, the shelf life is 24 hours and um, the indications for use, um, it is used for IgA negative individuals or persons. For frozen red blood cells, shelf life is 10 years. Um, it must be stored at negative 65 degrees Celsius. 
And for our deglycerolized red blood cells, the shelf life is 24 hours. So this is for rare phenotypes and also to increase oxygen levels. Okay, so for our platelets, we have several types of components for our platelets. We have the random donor platelet, which has a shelf life of five days, and we have to store uh, take note guys that all of our platelet components must be stored at room temperature that's 20 to 24 degrees Celsius with constant agitation. Okay, so for random donor platelets, um, indications for use include thrombocytopenia, um, disseminated intravascular coagulation, and for um, patients who are prone to bleeding. Okay, our single donor platelet, on the other hand, the same with our RDP, it has a shelf life of five days and um, it's used for platelet refractoriness. For irradiated platelets, um, again, if there is an irradiated or irradiation right after the name of the component, the purpose of that is to prevent your graft versus host disease. And... Um, if you, you also have pooled platelets, uh, the shelf life for this is 4 hours only and its indications for use include thrombocytopenia, DIC, and bleeding. And if our platelets are leukoreduced, um, that means um, uh, febrile reactions from the recipients must be prevented. For our FFP, the shelf life would depend on the storage temperature of the component. So if the FFP is stored at negative 18 degrees Celsius, um, it has a shelf life of one year. And if it's stored at a much colder temperature, which is 65 degrees Celsius, it has a shelf life of seven years. Um, our FFP and PF24, they both have the same shelf life, storage temperature, and indications for use, which include coagulation deficiency, liver disease, DIC, and massive transfusion. For our cryoprecipitate, um, the shelf life will depend on the kind of cryoprecipitate we have. So if the cryoprecipitate is a frozen cryo, it has a shelf life of one year and the storage temperature is at negative 18 degrees Celsius. For thawed cryoprecipitate, it has a shelf life of six hours. And for pooled cryo, it has a shelf life of four hours. So take note that if your cryoprecipitate is either thawed or pooled, the storage temperature is just the same, 20 to 24 degrees Celsius. And then our cryo can be used for patients with hemophilia A, von Willebrand disease, factor 13 deficiency. Um, it can also be used as a fibrin sealant and for patients who have hypofibrinogenemia. I think this is hypofibrinogenemia. Okay, so that is the indications for use of your cryoprecipitate. For our white blood cells, okay, for our granulocytes, irradiated or not, they both have a shelf life of 24 hours and their storage temperature is at 20 to 24 degrees Celsius. So that is your that is room temperature. For granulocytes, um, indication for use, um, it's for patients who have neutropenia or decreased um, WBC count. So that is less than 500 polymorphonuclear cells per microliter. And for irradiated granulocytes, again, if there is irradiation after the word, um, the word after the name of the component, that is indicated for um, preventing your GVHD and also neutropenia. For our additional notes on blood components, so if you're able to donate one unit of red cells to your recipient, um, his or her hemoglobin level would increase by 1 gram per DL and the hematocrit would increase by 3%. For random donor platelet, for random donor platelet or the RDP must contain at least greater than or equal to 5.5 times 10 to the 10 platelets. The STP on the other hand must contain at least greater than or equal to 3 times 10 to the 11 platelets. Um, granulocytes, okay, our granulocytes must be um, greater than or equal to 1 times 10 to the 10 and our 
Lucoreduce products must contain um, less than 5 times 10 to the 6 residual WBCs. Okay, for the irradiation, okay, both the FDA and our AAB or the American Association of Blood Banks recommend a minimum dose of gamma irradiation of 25 GY to the central portion of the blood unit with no less than 15 GY delivered to any part of the blood unit. Irradiation may be achieved using either a radioactive source that is your um, cesium-137 or the cobalt-60 or x-ray. So to confirm, if a product was irradiated, a radiochromic film label is affixed to the component before it is placed into the metal canister of the irradiator. So darkening of the film confirms irradiation requirements. So the expiry for an irradiated product is whichever date is sooner. So that ends our discussion on blood donation and blood component preparation. So it's quite a long discussion you know, for lecture two on blood donation, but I hope that you got or pick something out from our discussion today. And I think um, all I can say is that we should donate blood and save a life. If you are able to donate a blood, then do it. Okay, but for those individuals who cannot donate blood, it's fine. Okay, um, we don't need to force anyone to donate. But if you have the capacity or if you have the ability to donate blood, please do so. Okay, um, thank you so much for listening to this long discussion. And um, if you have any questions, you can ask me um, if we are going to meet during our class. Okay, so thank you so much and have a good day.